show is going to begin. So we want to welcome you all tonight and thank you so much for coming out and supporting our first ever slide night and my partner John Goldsmith's first event in his fabulous gallery which I'm hoping will be the first of many amazing community events so get on the mailing list because there's going to be a lot of exciting things happening here so I want to thank um, and tell you all how thrilled we are to have such a compelling group of artists showing with us tonight. That's Annie Briard, Rydell, Cerezo, sorry, Donna Mueller, Jake Kimball, and Dina Goldstein. And I'd love to- yeah, give a hand for these fabulous artists. And I'd like to introduce my multi-talented and lovely partners in this venture. Uh, Roger, Larry, and John Goldstein. Woo! Take it away, Roger. Goldstein. <laughs> <laughs> we have Golden Goldstein. Oh, oh Goldsmith. I am so sorry. Oh, oh, I'm fired. Confused. That's it. <laughs> uh, Thank you all. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. No, you go. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. We're so grateful. It's so wonderful to see this turnout to have these fabulous artists in this wonderful new space. Uh, something we didn't mention in our publicity that we should mention now is that we actually are splitting the gross receipts minus Eventbrite's bite uh, with the artists tonight. So your, your, your fee does go towards artists at least a little bit. Interestingly, that when it's split between the five artists, it comes to six, 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 <laughs> six cents. And I take that as a good omen, but that's me. Um, I would like to acknowledge that we are grateful to uh, be on the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil uh, And uh, we also want to thank our sponsors. Uh, Fusion City gave us this fabulous, crazy projector. Nobody bang it. <laughs> um, and uh, Printmaker Studio, Relevision, Bomber Beer. And we'd like to thank the Capture Photography Festival for including us as a community event. Um, a, fest, a festival that our, our partner, Julie Lee, co-founded. Uh, we'd also like to thank our... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, we, uh, we'd also like to thank our five talented artists. Um, and our new partner, Allison Powell, who's doing front of house tonight, doing social Yay. media. Our designer, Natalie Rogers, our tech, Taylor Ritchie. And at the bar, Amico Venray. We will be having... Uh, and, and you guys. Thank you. John? Hello everyone, welcome tonight. Uh, this has been a dream of mine for a while and I'm so happy to see this energy in here. So thank you for coming out tonight, especially the artists. This wouldn't be happening without you. So thank you. And um, I just wanted to say this is really, this space is really about community, about collaboration, about creating new things. So uh, we're, we are collaborating with a lot of partners, uh, a lot of wonderful people. Tonight wouldn't be possible without Julie Lee and Roger Larry, so thank you. And, um, and all of our sponsors. So thank you, everyone, um, and enjoy the night. Yay. Oh, you take that. Oh, my dog. Somebody that obnoxious dog. Oh, wait a minute, that's my dog. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, it is with great pleasure that I am introducing Donna Mueller as our first presenter this evening. So Donna is a Canadian photographer with a place-based practice creating large format black and white images. Donna was born in Winnipeg and is Mati and Anishinaabe. She has a PA in political science from UBC and a JD in law from Allard Hall. In 2016, Donna received a photography diploma from CAP Photo School in Switzerland and is scheduled to finish an MFA in photography in April 2023 at Falmouth University, UK. Donna's work is exhibited internationally and is part of permanent and private collections worldwide, including Allard School of Law, Donna, Donna's work is included in the Truth and Reconciliation ex Exhibition at the Royal British Columbia Museum. Donna, thank 
you so much, Julie and Roger and John, for inviting me to present here tonight. Can everybody hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And I would like to acknowledge that I live, work, and play on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And the work that I created in this exhibition that, I, that I'm going to show you was all created on Treaty 4 in the province of Manitoba in summer 2022. This talk is called Unforgotten, My Journey Home and is also an exhibition that is part of Capture Photo Festival that is showing at Monica Reyes Gallery, which is literally two, two blocks down the street. So if you haven't seen it yet, I invite you to see it. It's on until the end of the month. And it is about my reclamation journey into my indigeneity. I'm a 60s scoop child, and for anybody that doesn't know what that is, between the 1950s and the 1980s, indigenous babies were often taken from their mothers at birth and placed in non-indigenous families. It was part of a government policy of assimilation and my mother was one of those mothers. She was 17 years old, she was young, she had no money, she had no family support, she had no husband. So it was very easy for her, for the, the social workers uh, to remove me from her and put me into a very unsuspecting Canadian-Ukrainian family. Mm. They had no idea, my, my adopted parents. They were told that I was French and because of my recessive skin color from my father, whose origins are from the Czech Republic, they had no reason to believe otherwise. But my mother, my birth mother, is Métis and Anishinaabe and comes from a long line of strong women. Here is my great-grandmother and my grandmother, and they were both medicine women and shamans. And my mother here on the left is uh, Imelda. 17 year, 19 years ago, I met my birth mother for the very first time and subsequently met my siblings, of which I have seven. I was raised an only child until I was 44 years of age. I never knew one person that I was related to. And all of a sudden, I have seven siblings, 11 living aunties and uncles, and literally hundreds of cousins. So for my final major project in my FMA in photography, I decided to focus on this very personal story for the first time. I've never really outed myself in such a public way. My previous work has been about climate change and global warming issues. But I decided to focus on this because it had been brewing for such a long time and I wanted to make a journey into my, my own reclamation journey into my indigeneity. So I gave up my digital photography practice and I bought this large format camera that I didn't know how to use. And so I went into the school of YouTube to learn how. <laughs> and I took myself on this journey for 6,338 kilometers through Manitoba to the north with parts of the trip, my uncle, and parts with my mother and my sister. And for anybody that's been to Northern Manitoba, <laughs> you know this is what you have to wear. <laughs> because the bugs are brutal oh, and it was 40 degrees but I had to be covered from head to toe because literally they were biting through my clothes so I traveled around part of the journey with my uncle my mother's 83 year old brother and he in the in the the tradition of oral storytelling spent hours every day telling me the stories of our family of our ancestors on the footprint of his parents, my grandparents' home. He's sitting on the fireplace hearth right now and just telling me how it was for them and what they did and how he grew up. My grandparents uh, were fisher people and they fished and that's how they made their livelihood. They sold their fish to the Hudson's Bay Company. And after I left that part with my uncle, I went to Brandon, Manitoba, where I picked up my mom and two of my sisters and we continued on the journey, and I wanted to take my mom to the place of her birth and some places where her ancestors came from, where she had never been before. So we ended up in this place called Duck Bay, Manitoba, and this document on the left-hand side is a script, a Métis script, which I got from the National Library and Archive in Ottawa with permission to reproduce it. 
And it's a script from my great great grandfather where he ceded his rights to live on his Indian reserve in 1887 for $240, which is the equivalent of $6,000 today. And with that $240, he had to take his wife and his six children and leave the reserve and could never return. I wanted to take my mother there to show her this land, and she stands on the banks of the Duck Bay Lake where her great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather, fished. Then we traveled around a little bit of this area, our historic ancestral area, with uh, the woman second on the right. On the right. She is the, one of the band counselors. And she toured us around. This, this, the, the Duck Bay Band was not part of treaty. This is all Treaty 4 territory. But they were not signatory to treaty because they were arbitrarily left out by the Indian agent who was going around signing up the bands to, to treaty. So the neighboring band, the, the Pine Creek Band, is a signatory to treaty. But the Duck Bay Band was erroneously left out. And they're currently in negotiations with the Ministry of Indigenous Affairs now to be retroactively included in treaty, which is amazing. They've been in the process for one year. They still have another year to go. So if it ends favorably for them, this band will be part of the treaty. And I've applied to be a member of this band. It's Anishinaabe and Métis. People ask me if my birth mother and my adopted mother ever met as I'm talking about the story and making my work. And I am really, really happy and thankful and so grateful that they did. Eight months before my adopted mother died in 2016, both of my mothers met. And this picture I snapped in a moment when they were both hugging and thanking each other for me. And it's one of the most valuable photographs that I have. And I'm so thankful that they had that opportunity to meet. And people always say, oh, you look like your birth mother. And I didn't really realize it until I made a collage of both of our faces and cut half of our faces and superimposed them on the other. And now at least I know uh, how I'll look when I'm my mother's age. <laughs> it's remarkable, isn't it? I think we look exactly alike. And she's only 17 years older than me, so she's 80 now. Amazing genes, right? <laughs> I came back home, I spent three months in the dark room, West End Community Center, again, School of YouTube. I taught myself how to develop my negatives, four by five inch negatives, print my document, or print all of my work. And I didn't know initially how I wanted it to look, but it's a dark story and I didn't want it to look picturesque or pretty. I wanted to create something that was um, it was that I it was explaining and redolent of this liminal space that I found myself in bridging these two cultures. And so I ended up creating images with multiple exposures. I, I layered the negatives and I ended up printing it on this special paper. And for anybody that's analog, it's Harman Direct Positive, which means it's meant for in camera. And this is the largest it comes. It's meant for in camera because it, it actually um, creates the, the positive image in camera. But when you use it in the dark room from a negative, it prints a negative. So everything is dark and everything is inverse of what it should be. So the multiple exposure negative image ended up giving me exactly what I wanted in terms of showing that really dark, deep ancestral history. And I want to conclude with a poem that I wrote in my book. I have my books here for sale. I put a book together as well for my, my masters. And it has all of the images in it, uh, which you'll see at Monica Ray's if you go there. And I wrote a poem for my mother and all of the mothers who lost their babies during this horrendous time in our history. It's called Fragmented Lives. A partial component, never whole or belonging tormented by haunting sounds of relentless wind, alone with silent and empty echoes and memories of lost and invisible kin. A childhood spent in ill-fitting skin, straddling the precipice of cultural divide, unaware of the truth and the travesty, never knowing the lifeblood side. Colonized corruption with assimilation its goal, replete with manufactured lies and intentional theft stolen cultures and practices of genocide, leaving the wounds and the wounded empty, alone, and bereft. Thank you so much.
thank you, Donna, for that incredibly compelling, oh my God, amazing story. Thank you. Oh, I set my timer. Uh, <laughs> I set my timer. Wow. You were exactly 10 minutes. You're amazing. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, God. Why don't you get up? Um, yeah, that was just spectacular. And thanks for not barking. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're so excited about our next artist, who is Jake Kimball. When we go to the first slide for, for Jake. Um, Jake is a photo, Jake Kimball is a photo-based Chippewan artist from Treaty 8 territory. He currently lives and works on the stolen territory, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Swayage nations. Most recently, he attained a BFA in photography from Emily Carr, University of Art Design, holding a degree in acting from the Vancouver Film School. Kimball's practice mainly revolves around acts of self-care, self-repair, and gender-based ideological refusal. By doing so with a sense of humor, Kimball allows the audience to scale, unclench, and even chuckle in spaces where laughter is often lost. And if you get a chance, check out his show at the Bar Barard Arts Foundation, which is part of Capture. It's a, a, a photo installation that's just epic. Uh, Please give a warm welcome to Jake Kimmel. Thank you. Oh, hello, everyone. Masi Cho for coming tonight. Um, Masi Cho to Roger, Julie, and John for hosting this event. I'm thrilled to be a part of it. Masi Cho to all the artists. I'm thrilled to share your company. Um, Roger took a lot of my introduction that I had written down. So, you know, we're just gonna you know, we're just gonna go through it. Um, okay, so allow myself to introduce myself. <laughs> One of my favorite quotes from Sweet uh, <laughs> My name is Jake Kimball, and I'm a lens-based Chippewan artist from Treaty 8 territory and a member of the Deninaque First Nation in the Northwest Territories. My practice predominantly revolves around acts of self-care, self-repair, and gender-based ideological refusal by using the camera as an auto-ethnographic tool to examine and process personal identity. Photography is how I process my emotions, my relationship with my body and spirit, and how I process my place in the world. This is my own personal ceremony. By also using my body as subject, I reclaim my autonomy and my narrative, which is incredibly important to me as a two-spirited Indigenous artist. I was born in Hay River in the Northwest Territories, where I spent a fair amount of my childhood, um, oh, moving back in between Alberta and BC. Sorry, I made a big typo. <laughs> um, eventually graduating high school in Black Diamond, Alberta. I then spent the subsequent 10 years attending a variety of post-secondary institutions, such as Emily Carr University of Art and Design, Vancouver Film School, and the Fine Arts School of Bartending. <laughs> I eventually settled on Emily Carr, where I received my Bachelor's in Fine Arts, specializing in photography, so I guess we'll start there. Ooh. So I figured, let's get to know each other. <laughs> So, oh my God. <laughs> um, this was my second year final. Um, I never really knew that I was going to end up being a photographer. Um, and it just kind of, you know, happened that way. And so for my second year final assignment was to recreate a famous historical painting that we really love. Uh, mine was um, Edward Manet's Olympia. And yeah, this is just my kind of little cheeky spin on it. <laughs> um, moving forward, um, this was my second series called I'm Gonna Be Fine. Uh, my first solo show was all about emotion. I made these huge prints, and, yeah, huge, like 24 by 36, 42 by 62. Um, and I made these huge prints because I think I needed to see how much pain I was in, which led me to therapy, which was very healthy. <laughs> and fantastic for me as an artist as well. Um, and then, so moving forward, um, I obviously invented the last dinner. Um, 
And so, but again, working in self-portraiture and using that as a tool to, you know, deal with my own personal truths and traumas and existing with that, existing with those as an Indigenous, as a two-spirited Indigenous person is, you know, been incredibly healthy and healing and pleasant. Moving forward, um, a lot more um, self-portraiture, just kind of like dabbling around. Um, I don't have anything written for this one, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, but then graduating Emily Carr led me to my first solo exhibition at the Telephone Gallery, which is part of Macaulay and Company Fine Art on East 2nd. It's an amazing gallery. I suggest you go check it out. Um, but this was my first solo exhibition called Break a Leg. And I was very obsessed with, you know, the idea of youth the beauty and what it means to take care of oneself and how we don't really have, no one gives you a guide on you know, how to get through life. And I know that sounds so esoteric, but you know, we're all just trying our best. So I thought it would be funny to hyperbolize, play with that idea, and this is fried chicken. <laughs> and then, so moving from that, also, chicken shows up a lot in my work, particularly KFC, so... Oh, you like my first. <laughs> um, and so this, um, I developed a series with my grandmother, actually, after this, called Funny Bones. And so this is a series of four images. I'll just kind of guide through them. So this is one. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> And so this series was especially special for me because I've had such, I mean, I have such a close, intimate relationship with my grandmother. And I was thinking at the time about um, indigenous continuance and how that looks and how that, especially how Western society views indigenous continuance. There's this long kind of um, uh, preconceived notion that, you know, oh, it must be stoic, and you know, I am your grandmother, you are my grandson. And I really wanted to flip that on its head, and because me and my grandmother are like, both well, like, we're, we're goofy. And what's so funny, actually, about this series, I was coming down the stairs getting ready to do this, and I'm just wearing a t-shirt and like short shorts. And I was like, Grandma, are you ready? And she was like, Jake, you look like a slut. <laughs> and I just thought that was so special. <laughs> it did. Oh, really, it, it really was. And so, <laughs> moving from that three-piece combo um, was a series that I developed at the art gallery Evergreen. And so, really fixating on like you know, chicken and KFC, I wanted to dive into like, okay, what is that interest for me? Like, what, why, exactly? <laughs> and I wanted to develop this series. I, I wanted to mimic chicken, like figuratively with my body. I wanted to develop a series that represented like the transmutation of my two-spirited body into something that could be enjoyed, which is something that KFC has been for me. <laughs> and so I'm just like in this shot. And I actually had planned on having them all be as or be light boxes. Only a couple. Only the one worked chicken. out. Only the chicken worked out. I know. Yeah. Well, I mean, thank God. <laughs> um, After all that. <laughs> And then this led me to one of my most recent series, which is titled Grow Up. Um, and so this was a series of nine images, um, digging from my personal archive combined with studio portraits that I superimposed um, this lettering on top of, um, because I wanted to, for me, photography is all about processing. It just, it's, how I, it's how I make sense of things. And I wanted to layer these seemingly familiar adages that anyone could engage with, but that also have a um, kind of a, an elusive meaning. 
like for this one, you get all the happiness you deserve. At first, seem you know, it's like positive. It's like, oh, you get all the happiness you deserve. But also, there are some people who don't deserve a lot of happiness. <laughs> and so it's really about perspective. And, you know, I was told peace was mine to keep, which was just, you know, I mean, I had a very chaotic childhood. Um, and, you know, feeling very secure and proud to be the peacekeeper as a child. But, you know, looking back on it, it's, you know, that, that's, a, that's a big burden to bear. So the whole series is, God, this is so large. <laughs> um, but yeah, just kind of addressing those kind of truths and traumas of, you know, being a kid and what that means. And then, and this series actually was developed in Annie Briard's class, um, yeah. which is super exciting. I'm so grateful to like share space with her. It was super exciting. Um, and yeah, here are some more. And I also thought, like you know, I'm like I'm a philosopher, <laughs> so I thought it. I thought it just kind of paired up. Yeah. But yeah, just kind of. I thought it, these would be a great way to invite people in, and you know, just, you know, share share stories. I believe this is the last one. And then, yeah, you see them at the Polygon. And then, yeah, they are, this one is actually going to be exhibited in Toronto if you're in the area um, for contacts. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's their wall, I recommend. Mm -hmm. Great. Amazing. Yeah. Great I'm, spot. I, yeah, I'm, I'm super, it's a sweet spot. I'm, I'm thrilled. Yeah. It, yeah, I'm incredibly lucky. And then this leads to My Guardian Angel is Tired, which is my current exhibition, currently on exhibit at the Barard Arts Foundation. And so, I mean, we started with half of my naked body, might as well finish with my full <laughs> naked body, right? <laughs> and so this is my series, um, My Guardian Angel is Tired. And how it started was, it was a joke I used to make in my early 20s. I would, you know, after a big crazy weekend, partying all weekend, I'd stumble into work or into school, and then I'd tell people, I'm like, oh, my guardian angel is tired, <laughs> you know, she's been putting in work. And so, and it's a continuance of the last series, which was talking to my um, inner child. This one, I wanted to talk to, like, the inner adolescent, and the, I was like, what does the person who has been watching over me look like. Mm -hmm. And so each kind of, each substance represents, you know, a different part of, of my life that has really kind of taken up a lot of my guardian angel's time. <laughs> so we have sugar, which is, you know, addiction, drugs, people, sweetness. We have dirt, you know, trying to bury my sexuality, trying to bury sexual trauma, um, burying shame, snow um, in the middle there, um, you know, trying to freeze myself out because I used to think, you know, being cold was cool, but it's not. You just look like a dick. <laughs> um, and then honey, um, again, sweetness, alcohol, you know, really soaking in that. And then the bubbles on the end, which is um, reaching out for lightness, something ephemeral, a good time, something, something intangible. And so here's kind of an installation shot of it. Um, and so I had them all separated to really kind of represent, or to drive home the point that, you know, these were separations. And then the sister piece to this one is called Calling My Spirits Back. <laughs> and so I'm sure many of you can tell um, these, these last two images were heavily influenced by Rebecca Belmore, Dana, Dana Claxton, 
And with this one, like calling my spirit back, I was always taught to, after a very intense experience, whether that be a crazy party binge or a death or grief or just any type of intense emotional experience, you're always supposed to call your spirit home because your spirit wanders. And so this is, I needed to yell. <laughs> so this was me really just kind of, you know, calling her home. But also, you know, keeping a little bit of the fun, a little bit of the, a little bit of the sparkle. And um, yeah, the it's about, you know, um, Pasts, presents, and futures. And I believe that is my last slide. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> Um, it, I just saw the large piece at the Burrard Arts Foundation, mm. and it's in. This is in in. This is one piece that you can't quite envision properly here because it's these panels that are brought off the wall, and it's really spectacular. Yeah. It's really quite epic, and I encourage all of you to see it. Um, you know, I want to talk about the humor in your work and, and a, a little bit, but just. The work is so complex and beautiful, and the, the surprise of the humor. Um, you know, we talked about this a little bit before. Mm -hmm. Why is that so important to you? I mean, it, it's how we survive. It, 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 it's how we survive. I mean, I'm sure we've all like had like a moment where like shit has just gotten so fucked up, <laughs> where like you're just like. Oh. Why not? Like, and I think that there is such, there's such a beautiful power in humor and just because it literally is a, this visceral reaction. It's a release from the body. And I think that utilizing that, that reaction in art is, it, it, it's so, it's, it's powerful. It's inviting. It's loving. It's, I, I, yeah, I, there's nothing like it. No. <laughs> Wonderful. I, I think. Yeah. yeah. Questions from the audience? Any questions from the audience? Great. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, one last one. I mean, it's especially, you know, you as a two-spirited indigenous person, um, there's so much uh, resistance in the culture right now. Wow. It's such a fire truck, and so many people are going towards just going ballistic on each other. And mm -hmm. is there is are you interested in changing hearts and minds? I feel like your work persuades people. Could you imagine if I said no? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm not. He said no. <laughs> he says in, the script, in the script, he says no. no. You're going off script. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, yes, of course. I mean, I think all we, I mean, all we have is each other. I mean, I know how that sounds. But I mean, really, that is that is it. And chicken. And chicken. <laughs> so yeah, I I think it's incredibly important to just you know to address these like uh, systemic issues in multiple ways. And I mean, humor is not like the only like way to do that. Like, and I'm, and I'm not saying that. I, I there are so many tools to like combat that. And so I think yeah, utilize them all. Yeah. And you do. Thank you so much. So, before I introduce Dina, I want to be Donna back up for Q and A because I somehow spaced that out. So, because my alarm was going off. It's your alarm, yeah. Let's blame it on you. So, does anyone? Can I throw the questions out to the audience? Does anyone have any questions for Donna? None. Oh, no, no, you go. No, you go. You go. You go. You go. You go. Uh, yeah, there you go. Can you 
great show. Yeah. You know, you told us so much about the uh, about the, the backstory and how you played your history. But the images also are formally very impressive. Could you talk a little bit about besides the camera process itself? You know, where you see yourself in a tradition of either painting or photography or both. Yeah, I'm not really sure how to answer that. Other than, you know, I, I mean, for the last 10 years, I've been a, a professional photographer working with a digital uh, medium. And I really, because this was a project that was so personal and it was about my history and my ancestry and my reclamation journey, I wanted to use a historic photographic apparatus and I wanted to make everything by hand. So that was the impetus and the motive, the motivation for me to look at a large format. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Sally Mann, who won the Pic Day Prize last year. You know, she works with large format, and just being informed by all the the contemporary artists that are working with large format today. There's not a lot of them, and not a lot of women, but I really wanted to just use that old historic medium to create this newfound world and life for myself. And, and I also wanted to do all the work by hand in the darkroom. And it took forever, and it cost a fortune, and I made so many mistakes. But as all the academics in here know, that's how you learn, right? And you know, the school of YouTube helped a lot. But I, I just, I think that in terms of the, I, I saw what I wanted in my mind. I didn't quite know how I was going to get it, but it was experimenting in the darkroom and layering the images and just, you know, through trial and error, I wanted it to be something that was not a, a, a pictorial, literal image. I wanted something a little bit more abstract. And if you, when you see the show, I mean, there's a lot of, there's some images that are just very abstract. You know, it's just thicket, bushes, and very, mm -hmm. very Gordon Smith. You know, I love Gordon Smith so much. And, and he was a friend before he passed, and I had some of his work, and he was really inspiring for me. So in terms of the abstractness and going in that direction, I think he was a huge influence. Did I answer your question? Sorry. Yeah, totally. Off on a tangent. Go see the show of Hot Reyes. It's beautiful. Yeah. We've got a question in the audience. Yes. Yeah. How did you find your birth family? Well, in Man Manitoba was closed, one of the last two provinces that was closed in 2003, 2004, and unless both parties registered at the adoption registry, they would only release non-identifying information. So I applied for that, and when I was pregnant with my second child, at 44, I got the documents in the mail, and I was in bed, and I was reading through everything, and the names were redacted, and the towns where they were from was, were redacted, but there was descriptive information, and it said, and, oh, and I also had my birth certificate with my name on it, so I knew my name was Karen Megabosch, Bush, and the, after the redacted names of my mother and her sibling, there was French slash Indian, which in 1960 was Métis, right? And I studied political science in the 80s, and my undergrad was, I majored in Native Indian Studies, as it was called then, without even knowing I was Indigenous. Mm -hmm. So wow. that was a huge wake-up call to realize at that moment that I was Indigenous. And then I found a searcher because the ministry was, the, the adoption registry was closed. Um, for you know this information, they wouldn't release it. So I hired a private searcher, and he found her in two weeks. He looked at the alphabet on the you know as, as it was typed out in this information, and he basically, through his investigative skills, was able to figure out the name of the town possibly. And there was some descriptive information about my cousins or my uncle's fishing, and mining, and. Um, he called my uncle Ernie. He found him in the book. Called him up, asked if uh, you know his sister had a baby. And two weeks later, I found my mom. I was on the phone, and, and we met. And... Wow, amazing. Wow, right. I have a question. Does your mother still live in Duck Bay? No, she never lived in Duck Bay. She uh, was born in Camperville and grew up in Thicket Portage, and she lives in Brandon now. Okay, so I, I. Grew up close to Camperville, so that story just is really touching wow, to me. That's my next friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh? So, what town did you oh, grow up? Live closest. Oh my goodness! So of course we drove by there. So you know the bugs, right? You know <laughs> the bugs. <laughs> <laughs> that story is very touching when you say you to Bay and around that area. It's very interesting. Yeah, thank you. It was very touching for me to take my mother to the place where her great-grandfather seated his right. Your mother must be so proud of you 
to have come this far in life, right? Yes, she's very proud. Yeah. And I, I get asked this all the time because I know a lot of people who are adopted who don't have these kinds of stories, but I have been, and literally I have hundreds of cousins, and you know, I'm related to every person that I met on this journey in Thicket Portage, Camperville, and Duck Bay, related to every person. Like in the ground and above ground. It was absolutely mind boggling to me. And they have all embraced me with love and open arms and affection. And I, I, I can't believe it. I'm just, I'm so great. It's great. It's a wonderful story and it's a wonderful photo. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks again, Donna, for sharing your beautiful story with us. So, um, Dina, thank you, Goldstein, um, I became a fan of Dina's in 2012 when I walked onto the set of In the Dollhouse, where she had created this elaborate, cinematic, you know, attention to detail with actors, and it was this whole trajectory, like, amazing story of Barbie, like, incredibly <laughs> fascinating. So I have followed her. That's an unhappy story. An unhappy, amazing story, yes. But I've followed her series over the years and have been uh, really proud to see that you know, she's gotten the international acclaim that she's deserved. And um, you. Whoops. give you a little background into Dina Goldstein. So Dina began her career 30 years ago as a photojournalist, evolving from a documentary and editorial photographer into an independent artist focusing on large-scale productions of nuanced narrative photography tableau. Her work is highly conceptual and complex social commentary, incorporating cultural archetypes and iconography from the collective common imagination with narratives inspired by the human condition. Leaning into the visual language of pop surrealism, she stages compositions that expose the underbelly of modern life, challenging the notions of cultural influence and inherent belief systems. The vivid and provocative still imagery emerges through an entirely cinematic technique, with Dina's established methodology following a precise pre to post production process. Goldstein's work has been the subject of academic essays and dissertations and has been covered extensively in the media around the globe. Dina. Good, I don't have to say much of what I wanted to say because Julie just introduced me. Um, exactly like she said, I work uh, in series. Uh, usually, uh, there are about 10 in a series. Um, this one was my most political one yet, and it was inspired by the election of Donald Trump. <laughs> the continuous injection of religion into policy, neglect of gun control, the clawback of women's rights, hypocrisy, racism, misogyny in society, government, and within the United States of America. Uh, and this chipping away of democracy was very concerning and I'm sure to everybody at the time. Um, so I wanted to examine the, con uh, the concept of American idealism, uh, but of course through a Canadian lens. We are next door neighbors with so many similarities, but we're so different from Americans and I wanted to examine that. Uh, and I continued with my overall theme of disillusionment um, uh, and to inspire uh, discourse and insight into how uh, American society went so astray and diverted from the American dream. Okay, let's start with Trump. There's some Kentucky fried chicken there for Jake. Uh, it's a motif tonight. Yes, that's the motif. Uh, so, uh, I, so I, what I did is I partnered, I paired uh, an American president with one of the Ten Commandments. So, of course, who better to illustrate the first commandment than Trump? You shall have no other gods before me. And this 
uh, photo uh, has themes of greed, desire, temptation, power, and the location is a White House uh, private residency. And money and celebrity is God in today's America as a culture of commercialism and narcissism is highly valued and cultivated. And terms such as fake news and witch hunt created the illusion of popularity for ideas that actually had no basis in reality. And that's how a clown made it into the presidency. <laughs> Ronald Reagan, you should not make for yourself a carved image of any likeness or anything that is in heaven above or, or below. Uh, the themes here were ego, immortality, persona, heroic, individualism, and the location 911 Memorial. <clears throat> uh, so this is the era of the selfie and access to social communication and mobile cameras has opened up a new genre of self-identity. So how do Americans portray themselves on social media? It's all wrapped up in this desire to document while living and to appear happy at every moment. Commandment three, Nixon, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. So I uh, loosely, my interpretation of it was the concept of omnipotent power. And here you can see that there are the Google head office there. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was my critique about uh, Google and large cor corporations that mo monopolize and monetize personal information. And also um, their anti-competitive actions that deprive uh, consumers of benefits of competitive choices and uh, a lack of innovation. Um, and the themes here were data collection, privacy, heroic individualism, and location, Google headquarters. Theodore Roosevelt, a commandment for remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And themes here, myths of progression, of progress, sorry, lack of stillness, and location is a man cave. Um, and the weekend is a time when um, you know, the extravagant um, games are aired and ac activities are scheduled and shopping and vi virtually everything else but rest. This is Washington. Commandment five, honor your father and your mother. So the themes here were respect, isolation, mortali morta uh, mortality and meaninglessness and the location is an urban uh, senior's living home. The value of the wise elder archetype has diminished, and we often see seniors abandoned in rest homes and left without proper care. And we really saw that during the pandemic, didn't we see that? Uh, so those affected by mental illness uh, suffer the most, unfortunately. Abraham Lincoln, you shall not murder. Themes, violence, despair, mental illness, Location, Sandy Hook Elementary School. The Second Amendment to the Constitution allows access to military-grade guns in America that has placed weapons into the hands of disgruntled and the mentally ill. Children and innocents are regularly targeted in mass shootings, such as the one at Sandy Hook, and who would have thought that it would happen again and again and again and again? <clears throat> JFK, you shall not commit adultery. <laughs> the institution of marriage, uh, marriage has been the cornerstone of American middle class. Uh, re recently, the country opened itself to same-sex marriage, but only some states. Social and uh, religious stigma rejects divorce and leaves uh, couples often frustrated in their, in their uh, marriage. Obama, you should not steal. <laughs> Themes, greed, ego, power, location, New York, stock exchange balcony. Theft comes in many forms, and the pure greed displayed by Wall Street during the Great Recession of 2008 was so blatant and distressing. People lost their homes. Wall Street was bailed out and rejoiced. Nine. Bush, 
You should not bear false witness against your neighbor. The themes were social manipulation, propaganda, media persuasion, and this is a location, it's not real, but Arlington Advertising Agency. Mm -hmm. So President George Bush, like his father, George H.W. Bush, ooh, uh, led the United States into war against Iraq. And the main premise for it was uh, Saddam had nuclear um, uh, weapons of mass destruction and that these were at risk at falling uh, to the hands of terrorists. In the end, however, there were no such weapons and Saddam's links to Al-Qaeda were never proven. Commandment 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant, dot, dot, dot. Themes, materialism, envy, fraternity, the location is a suburban American neighborhood. Um, the American dream was once out of reach of the middle class, but uh, while don't spend above your means will always be sound advice, keeping it up with the Joneses has become endemic within many households. And this aspirational materialism with the rapid growth of medical and housing costs, dwarfing incomes, makes it challenging for, uh, for many families to sustain uh, desired lifestyle without leaning on credit cards and loans. That's what you have to do to keep that lifestyle. And um, I thought maybe you would just like to see some behind the scenes photos of uh, the way I make my pictures. I work with a small skeleton crew and um, I collect all the uh, props and all the materials needed for uh, the shoot. And I work with a small team of people who are like a little set, little powerhouse set. And um, I film everything um, and create um, behind the scenes videos because people are very interested in the process. So uh, if anybody would like to see any of these films, you can always go to my um, website and um, yeah, and, 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 and take a look at all my, my series. I have a few of them now. Um, I've got a few of them now. So you can uh, take a look and uh, thank you so much for hearing uh, me. Oh, thank you, Dina, for sharing that. I mean, I wish you could share all oh, of them. Stand up, Dina. You're not off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're all <laughs> so different and so, you know, interesting. Obviously, dives deep into um, society and politics. And um, can I throw questions out to Donna? Yes. <laughs> Fascinating. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, I have a million questions, but I, I'll just pose one. How long? <laughs> Um, how long does it take you to do one set? I mean, it's so uh, about a year. Wow. wow. Yeah, it takes me about a year because it's, uh, you know, uh, m the most important thing for me is finding the model. I usually use actors because this person really has to get into that character. So finding the person and then the location is also so important to me. So uh, those two things... Um, really uh, are the the um, foundation of where I start. And then I build it and build it and build it and create the narrative. Sometimes people don't get my narratives, but they're supposed to make you uh, kind of chuckle. And, you know, I, I believe in adding humor to art and making it more palatable because, you know, sometimes a lot of my themes are very serious. So I, I like to pink it up for Barbie and make it pretty and, kind of uh, get people talking and cri uh, get people um, to think critically and to start a um, conversation. And, and how do you find your actors? Do you, do you go to an agency? Do you put a public call out? Or I, Sometimes I'll chase you down the street. <laughs> uh, you did that the other day. <laughs> um, no, like uh, for that person, that was somebody that was just walking through the shot and we were shooting uh, in the east side, actually not far from here the other day. Very interesting experience, always shooting on the east side. If you get a chance to look up The Last Supper, I photographed that, photographed that here on Maine and Cordova 
and it's always challenging because I'm not like, uh, I don't have the big budgets of the film sets and all that, so we're, we're a small crew creating these kind of big ideas here in the city. Amazing, thank you. Thank you. I can, I have one question. I can see how you went from photojournalism to um, this type of narrative, but like, how did you make the leap into doing something so um, cinematic and um, stay on Trump for a while? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I was a photojournalism, uh, photojournalist and I wanted to continue talking about important issues, but I also saw a change in photography uh, when, I, when we went from analog to digital and I felt like photography, the value of photography was degrading, the quality of the pictures were degrading. So I said to myself, I don't want to take pictures that everybody can take. I want to take pictures that, uh, you know, are developed in my mind and, and that really nobody, you know, could think of the same things that I'm thinking of and create the same thing. So I want it to be completely original in a world that's just like image after image after image after image. And mm -hmm. so I wanted a picture to really stand out and, uh, and, and people are going to have to look at every little detail and gather the story, you know. Thank you so much, Dina. Thank you, everyone. Hi, we're, we're going to have a 20-minute a, a break, but just before, I'd like to thank Jeffrey Chung for his beautiful work that is on the wall. Which we can check out. This opening is this Saturday night. It's the first opening for the gallery. And we'll turn on the lights so you can have a look. Why isn't that showing? Yeah, and don't go because there's two the more over. great artists. Yeah. 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 Okay, guys, here we go. I'm just going to be like, what's up in it? John, can we lose the lights? Okay, guys, we can just get your attention. And a big hit for Julie Lee. Yeah! Thank you. Okay, so next up is Rydell Sarizo. Okay, I saw Rydell's show at the Polygon a few months ago, and I was just so blown away. And then I was over at my friend uh, Ron Regan, who was here earlier, that you probably know from Frank Gallery, a colleague and friend of mine, and uh, he had a one of his pieces on the wall, and I'm like, I really like that guy. <laughs> anyway, so here he is tonight, we're delighted. So, Rydell investigates the spaces between sexuality, religion, and race. He is interested in how these disparate themes metaphorically and visually coalesce. Cerizo instrumentalizes the camera as a means to work through ideas of ancestry and destiny. Cerizo has presented exhibitions internationally, including Aperture Foundation, the Vogue Italia Festival, and the Polygon Gallery. Cerizo was shortlisted for Philippi Lind Emerging Artist Prize in 2020, and he was long listed for the Sobe Art Award in 2022. So, no further ado, welcome to the stage. Hello, everyone. Can you guys hear me from the back? No? Yeah. Okay, we're good. Okay, great. Um, so, thank you for the introduction. I think that explains everything about me, and I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so I was born in the Philippines in 1996. That makes me 26 years old now. And I moved to, I don't know, um, and I moved to Canada around 10 years old and made work in but they'll make art and that's it. Um, but anyways, this series of my SC was actually quite a seminal series that helped propel, propel my career as an artist and I made it in the last year of my BFA and it's titled A Maya C. So in this series I was thinking through a lot about what it meant to grapple about the grapple all these disparate themes that we just talked about 
being queer, being raised as a Catholic, and also being Filipino in this case. And I found that all these things, all these themes were either paralleling each other or contested one another. And I was curious to see like how that would visualize in an image or in photography. So, um, and then last in this project, I really wanted to um, make these images that was based in the church that I went to in Clo Cloverdale. And one of the biggest problems I kind of faced was I just knew how easily evocative pictures could be if you just made them in a church. Like, if you just knew, if you just, if you just know if you went to certain spaces to take some picture, they're just very charged. And I just knew in this architecture and in just the symbolism of everything there that I could easily be drowned out as an artist. And I was very interested in that problem, perhaps. How can I, as a person, how can my narrative come through in a space that is so charged and that is so monolithic that is the church. And a lot of this was me working through these problems and really thinking about how religion is essentially passed down generationally. And I think this is why I use my younger brother in the series as a reflection of me and my grandmother who I kind of worked it out after while looking and while making these images and while looking at these images, how she kind of represents this ge old, the generation that's um, passing down such knowledge and how intergenerational trauma, I guess, is given and like created. Uh, I actually have a really close relationship with my Lala. I love her. So <laughs> I think there is very interesting tensions that have and I really wanted to explore about these ideas about things that are traumatizing, but also people that you love. So I don't think it's very easy. And I think the space of tension is somewhere I always enjoy sitting in, in making art and not really in mental health wise, but <laughs> tension is a great place, I think. And that's where, uh, that's what I'm really interested in. Um, Yeah, so a lot of this also, working with this church and thinking about queerness for me, was looking at, I guess, part, these fissures essentially. This is a, a carpet and seeing where these physical cracks and physical, um, even like physical ailments, show the points of breakage that allow me to work out meaning. And that is within third spaces, perhaps. And I know I'm kind of like sounding kind of crazy right now. But it's these, it's in a Venn diagram, sometimes in my brain, I think about the way like queer theory and perhaps Roman Catholicism make its own separate space and they could be held together quite nicely. Or like Filipino culture and queerness or Filipino culture and Catholicism make another space of its own. And for me, this church was fascinating to me, especially just because Roman Catholicism was so ingrained into Filipino culture. It was like over now 300 years and still exists very evidently in the culture too. And how that's kind of transformed by uh, the Philippines and how being an immigrant and be a lot, well, being an immigrant here in Canada and how a lot of Philippines are just like known to immigrate outside of our own country how we commune with one another through um, the church. So that was fascinating for me because it was the this idea about religion and Catholicism being brought not only inside the home, but the home being transcended into this other building, which is the church. And that church also being a home in itself. I think one of the interesting critiques that I had during when I just showed in the Polygon was that people who didn't know that this was a church thought this was a home. And I really enjoy that kind of insider knowledge. If you were raised Christian or raised Catholic, that if you know, you know. And if you don't know, it seems a bit otherworldly. Um, and this is, yeah, also my younger brother. And I was also curious because my younger brother also um, was and is currently in a Catholic high school and was in a Catholic elementary. And I remember when he was only like, I don't know, grade four or grade five, he's like, 
Um, and I was always openly gay around him and it was chill, but then he started being like, oh, but I hear being gay is wrong and being all of that. And I'm just like, oh, that's fascinating. That's interesting. I'm not here to correct you, but it's interesting for me to really watch how the formations of one's own opinion is made through an educational institution, despite having and being grown, being like basically raised by a gay brother, essentially. Um, but I think with this image, I really enjoyed because I heard one other person who looked at it was that defiant look back of the camera was almost like an offering that he too was kind of a form of Christ, or he too had his own saint, like oh saintliness to him and his own power. Um, and I like that, enjoy that gaze back as well. Um, so transitioning to the work that I made in the Polygon Gallery, Home Sweet Home, I was, oh, should I keep going? Is this, did I take a few minutes? Sorry. How's that? Me? How, how am I good? Are you good? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. I'm trying keep, to go. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Okay, cool. Go, go, go. 33 seconds. Three, three, three. Three, three, three. Okay, I'll be fast. Um, so my recent work at um, Polygon Gallery called Home Sweet Home, I was in a a queer relationship with a Belgian dude, and we found out coincidentally that our last names meant the same thing, which was cherry. His, which was Dutch, <laughs> yeah, and mine in Spanish, which is also uh, Serrazo, which means cherry. Um, year, and then two years later, after still dating each other at the time, we recently found out, we found out that he had a distant relative that was not only a missionary, uh, in the Philippines, but was a really pr prominent missionary in the city that I was born and raised in, mm -hmm. and also that my grandparents knew of and mm -hmm. talked to. So it was kind of insane coincidences there. Um, so this is not him, but his is much cuter, younger brother. <laughs> but that's, that's him. <laughs> that's gotta find my dad out, right? <laughs> so this is where it kind of all began in Italy when I was spending time with their family and his great kind of granddad, granddad brought it up where she was like, oh, I actually knew of uh, my, one of my relatives was a missionary in the Philippines. And once we did that quick, quick Google search, our minds were kind of blown about this other um, connection that was made. The dad was being funny and he was like, what if you guys are related? And I'm like, he's six foot five and I'm like five two. I highly doubt that he was related. Um, so yeah, that's where it all began. And it was for me in this series because it kind of mixed with another series called To Be From the Same Tree. Uh, this was one of the images I made during my time with them in uh, Belgium. And this particular time, I was really interested in the ways in which um, how I kind of physically fit into this white family. It kind of began when his mom would make these Christmas pictures with all of his sons and uh, one year, they had all the sons there, and I wasn't there because they were in Belgium at the time. They had one of the sons' um, girlfriend in there. And it's like this beautiful, like picturesque white family. And I'm like, oh, how funny would it be if I was in there? Just like <laughs> one Filipino kid. And I think that like sparked my interest in this idea of like um, white spaces and thinking about interracial relationships and how I fit in, essentially, and how I navigate these spaces, essentially. Because also, reality is it's not only race, but it's also um, class differences that are things that I'm looking at. So in this image just here, I am both inside, but also outside. And that was one thing I was navigating between um, my relationship with them in that light. <laughs> yeah, it's a funny image. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Um, so this is the work that I showed at the Polygon Gallery, and you can see here. And then my second trip to Belgium in 2021, we actually came in contact with the one of the okay, I'll speak up. the one of the people who had Armand Laminers, who was that missionary. Um, uh, his archive, because he was actually a notable um, photographer as well. So in this um, uh, in this uh, show, I was interested in and kind of collaborate, using him as a collaborator um, as well and thinking about what it meant to be making photographs of his family and making photographs of his home in Belgium and that's kind of conversation back and forth. And that's why I kind of talk about the camera as this vehicle to talk about ancestry and destiny because I feel like it's this almost spiritual tool that allows me to speak through or this 
kind of tool that allows me to communicate with lives that was once past or this insane connection that we have made and these like echoes that happen like that in the bottom right is an image that he made years years ago about this road up to my city which is Baguio City because it sits on top of a mountain and I didn't realize that it kind of echoed this image I made from our trip from Italy to Belgium through the Alps. And this is just some of those images that I'll just quickly go through. And that's my show. Which was yeah. great. Thank you. Wow, that's really compelling and impressive for the work. Thank you so much. And I would love to um, throw questions out to the audience. Is there anyone who has a question for Riddell? Questions from the audience? Yeah, we have one right here. I saw your show at the Polygon. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, quite liked it. Thank you so much. Uh, and it's great to hear some of those stories from you. Mm -hmm. um, I was quite taken by the very intentional way that the uh, Polygon show or images were framed and presented mm -hmm. um, as a bit of a technical thing to craft, but I wonder how that very unique framing and presentation mm -hmm. uh, was derived. Like, how, how did that happen? I think it came from my first um, grad piece, which I started playing with frames, because I was interested in this. You, as photographers or people interested in photography, you kind of like pick a frame sometimes. But I saw it as an opportunity to make an intervention, essentially, like, oh, this is another space for me to make my name or how I can um, express myself, perhaps, in a different way. So especially for these frames here, I was interested in the way frames can be almost like bodies that extend and reach for one another, but also echo the architecture or the landscape or the context in which these, in which the images that exist within them. So that's my... Um, love for frames because also the frames in the show was made of mahogany which is like known to use for um, churches especially and cherry wood which kind of call back to the mm -hmm. other meaning so I just thought mm -hmm. why not make put more meaning yeah, yeah into that thank you any other questions okay so I'll ask you one what sure. um, so what's your your dream project Either what you're working on next, or do you have like a um, project that's just designed for the world? I feel like I remember like T Timothy Chalamet saying that if you want God to laugh at your plans, you say it out loud. <laughs> so I'm not gonna say anything. Uh, uh, all right, uh, we'll leave it at <laughs> But I am right now interested in just like making more portraits of people like outside of my own like family at this point. Oh, so we'll see where that takes me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good job with that one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank okay. you so much. Yeah. So next time we're going to tell the artist ahead of time that we're going to read their bio up front so we don't completely decimate their presentation as we've done to virtually everyone this, this night and uh, because our printer is broken I'm reading this shit off my phone. But I'm so excited to introduce Annie Briard who is an artist who um, came to my attention when I, I really plunged myself back into the Vancouver art scene. I was very much part of the Vancouver art scene in the 90s. And then, uh, for various reasons, my best friend leaving town, uh, I just was more low-key. And when I started to sort of re-familiarize myself with the work that was going on in town, um, Annie's work stood out. And, uh, um, we're very excited to have Annie here. Um, I'm, her work is selling. She's a professor at Emily Carr. It goes on and on. And you know what? If I left things out of your intro, you can add it. But uh, with great pleasure, <laughs> Annie Briard. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thanks for hanging around, folks. Yeah. To th thanks for being there, and thanks, thanks for the invite. Um, I've just been kind of gushing uh, to my students about this space and talking about how, uh, you know, for, for a city that's kind of 
uh, known worldwide for our photo sort of history, right? And and the, the way that our, um, I mean, we really made kind of a splash. But there hasn't been a kind of community hub, really, sort of on the ground uh, for photography in, in quite some time. And so um, it's just super exciting. Um, congratulations, John. Yeah, and thanks for doing this. Uh, so it's just, yeah, happy, happy to be there. Okay, um, I did not read the emails properly, maybe. Uh, I did not follow the format. Yes, um, yeah, I always, I mean, whatever. I, my students would laugh at me now because I tell them not to make excuses. And now I'm like, I was in critiques all week with my students. No, I'm not going to read my emails. Anyway, um, so I'm, I'm only going to share a couple of images. And you're going to have to use your imagination. Uh, and your ears to yeah, understand the rest. Um, I, I thought that I would, um, yeah, I thought that I would kind of show you a couple of series and then, yeah, everything's on my website, so you can always go dig deeper. I feel like my practice is really um, at, the, at the intersection of sort of new media, art, light and space, movement, and photography. And it's only really kind of coming to Vancouver that I felt like, oh, people are trying to squeeze me into photography, but I, I don't really belong there either. Like, it's, it's kind of this weird space that I'm in. Um, but this being a photo night, I have decided to focus more on some photo works, and, but maybe I can talk about some of the other influences. Um, so tonight, a couple of series, all very photographic and uh, based in, in landscape. So I'll... Oh, is there a play button? Let's see if this plays. Maybe it's doing it back. automatically. I think are you are you just trying to... Yeah, to this is a video. This is a video file. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. <laughs> it's really subtle. It works on you slowly. And, um, and that's part of the thing with my work is that it all really deals with screwing around uh, with your perception and with your kind of understanding of... Um, uh, yeah, I think it's working. Uh, your understanding of, of kind of light and space, um, the affect that we have as, as kind of embodied beings. And so oftentimes I make these works that are so subtle uh, that sometimes I'm even questioning them. I'm like, wait, is it working? Is it not? Um, it's funny, I, I've got a new series of light boxes and my assistant and I spent, I think, two days trying to fix a problem that then we realized wasn't actually there. <laughs> like the piece was working just fine. It was just working too well awesome. on us. Um, yeah, so, so this is a, this is a piece called Landscape Cutout, and it kind of, kind of comes from this idea of, um, mm, yeah, I don't know, is it playing? Maybe. We'll, we'll know in a few moments. Uh, but, but again, kind of, kind of thinking about like what, um, how, how we perceive the world and how our perception is really based in, um, you know, uh, light and how so much of it is kind of artificial and fabricated. Um, we only see the world through, we only perceive three colors, right? Red, green, and blue. And somehow we create these entire sort of universes um, for ourselves based off of just those three, three colors and that kind of sense of sight. And, and that's something that I'm always really thinking about in my work and, and kind of going back to and exploring um, in different ways. This is an older piece, uh, I think 2015, mm, and I was I was really taking kind of um, I was looking at I was looking at I guess videos as a way to make photography or photos as a way to make video like really durational photographs. One of the things that bothers me uh, about photography is that. I shouldn't say this. I'm going to get I'm a lot sorry. of haters in the room. Uh, this is the wrong crowd. Um, <laughs> um, part of the thing that, that bothers me is that for me, what, what brought me to art was deeply, deeply phenomenological and, and like kind of psychological um, affects with, with just perceiving the world around me, in particular the forest and, and different kind of landscapes. And so there was always a disappointment in photography's inability to kind of grasp um, that affect. As living beings, everything's always moving around us. We're moving. We are time-based. And so there was something that didn't work for the kind of things that I was trying to say by just arresting an image. Um, 
Yeah, this video is clearly not working, unfortunately, uh, but it is on my website, so you can see it. It is very subtle. You'll need to, if you scrub through it, you'll be able to kind of see. What I'm playing with here is using um, light in a subtle way. I'm kind of mimicking sunlight on a still image to bring out different um, aspects of the landscape and create different kind of feelings um, of depth of field. It's taken from um, a place called Angel's Landing in uh, Zahn National Park. And Angel's Landing, anybody here done it? It's like a little bit wild. There's, there's basically like a six foot length of almost like an arch of rock that's about this, this wide and this thick. And then it's, it's this, it's the precipice underneath. Um, anyway, so it's an image kind of taken from that. Um, yeah, it was, it was cool. Hiking is, there, is important. Is there a play button on the remote? That might there, oh, is that what this is? Might be. Oh, oh no. Now, now, I think it's. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh -uh. Oh, we'll have, have to come back to it. Back to it. Okay. No, I thought it knew. Yeah. Is it? <laughs> no. It's on the web. <laughs> you know what? Who cares? Yeah, you get it. You get the idea. You can go see it on the website. Um, here's another series that, uh, yeah, speaks to kind of, um, again, some of these ideas around the sublime and perception. But in this case, this was for a, a book project I was invited to do um, called Language, Language and Propaganda. And it was cool because it was a bilingual book. I'm from Montreal. My accent may come out later. Um, and, and it was sort of this bilingual book pairing uh, a couple of artists with a couple of writers, and it was almost like an exquisite course of sort of seeing what would happen, but, but each of us was still kind of coming back, you know, with our, our own views. And the writer that I was responding to was, was very much interested in um, uh, ideas around, around colonialism, and so I was thinking about landscape as this very colonialist uh, tool, right? There's a history within kind of especially uh, landscape painting of kind of trying to create the sense of, look, there's this pristine land here, this land of possibility, nobody's here, come over, make something happen, right? Um, that's, that's obviously super problematic. Mm, and this series was shot when I was uh, doing a, a residency in um, Iceland. I see you, yes, <laughs> in Iceland. Um, and yeah, just realizing the ways in which um, the, the additional kind of influx of tourism uh, is in a way almost like re recolonizing um, the land in a number of ways and and, and just showing uh, things. Mm, just can have a longer conversation about it, but the shapes are sort of almost stand-ins for uh, the human the human bodies that are being kind of erased within um, images in general, landscape images in general. Um, I didn't have enough 3D glasses. All of you, so we're not going to do that. Uh, but this is a series called Constructions, and um, it's it's a series where I I created um, I shot I shot all of these images on a long haul, like a three week um, backpacking trip uh, in the Sierra Nevadas, and I was really looking at it from the perspective of climate change, um, and then creating these images again. I'm sort of like a anti-photography photographer, so none of my photographs are ever like just photographs. Um, these of course are like 3D anaglyph photographs. And they were they were but they're really constructed in such a way as to you almost like feel the precipice. Um, the image almost feels more real than being in the place in, in reality in your body. And I was really excited about that idea. This one's called Fire Lake. And um, we hiked for days and days and days to this place that was supposed to have a lake where some person was supposed to pick us up and bring us to a place where there was like food, um, which <laughs> sounded awesome. And, you know, so we walked and we just, we kept just being like, okay, there's this place, it's going to be okay. And then of course we get there and this is the lake. Like it looked like a desert. It looked like a desert with aquatic plants um, living in it just because of uh, various sort of um, uh, climate change issues in, in California, but also very political issues, right, with, with mm -hmm. kind of land rights and water rights and, and how things are being um, mm -hmm. used. So there's a whole series around that. Um, yeah, that's one project. Mm -hmm. I don't know, how much time do I have left? I'm done. Okay, great. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Can you just come over? I'll end on this. Can we just bring you in a little bit? You want me to be blinded? I want you to be lit. Blinded by the light. Blinded, yeah. I think what Johnny does on those fires and hair rate shoots. It was wonderful, beautiful imagery. And I just, off the top, you talked about being an anti photographer photographer. And I think that's part of why we were so attracted to you because we're really uh, slide night. I think I don't want to speak for John, but um, we're you know lens based art you know transcends photography and is is just a larger part of visual art. And I think you embody that so wonderfully. Um, Annie has these beautiful sculptural large light boxes that have nothing to do with lens based. 